Let's just jump over into the Bible to Luke chapter 7. Uh, if you have a Bible, open it. Go there. If you don't have a Bible, grab one of them off the tables. The page numbers will be up on the screen. Use your device, whatever you want to do. Um, while you're turning there, I want to ask you uh, Luke chapter 7, and it's going to be uh, verses 11 through 17. But how many, how many are sports fans here? Okay. Sports fans? Most people, sports fans. Do um, you have a favorite? Who's your favorite? Who's your favorite athlete? Who? The Yankees, that's your favorite athlete. Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter, he's retired. Right? Jessica. Who? Doug Flutie. <laughs> oh, the Packers, yes. Who's, who's got his favorite athlete? Flutie. Jeter. I already said that. Giving away if you let the cat out of the bag. Mike likes LeBron. That's my favorite player. LeBron Ah, get out of here, Dan. <laughs> Kobe from there. Um, my favorite athlete, Larry Bird. It's my Jesus favorite boss, it makes sense, right? I love, we used to call him Larry Legend, and, and he was amazing. Not only was he super talented, but one of the reasons why I and many people loved him is because he was just clutch. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you go to YouTube, you can see these videos of his last second antics, where at the end of the game, he's fallen out of bounds, you know, three-point land, he chucks it up, and he just makes it. I mean, it's just a, this is just who he was, you know? So that's why we call him Larry Legend. Guys like Magic Johnson, you know, he's a Laker. I hate him. Christian hate. You'll get over but, it. Uh, I'll get over it. Um, <laughs> Michael Jordan, you know, just give me the ball, coach. Give me the ball. You know, at the end of the game, he's the, when, the, when it's all on the line, you want to give it to that guy. And not only that, but he wants the ball. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, Larry Bird, Ma Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan. Call um, me. In football, um, undeniable, like John Elway was one of those guys, like, how many last drive of the game wins? You know, like, the team is down, they got one last chance, and he marches down the field, and he scores the touchdown, or gets the, the uh, field goal that they need to win the game. Undeniable champion, legend, and then another guy, I hate to say it, Mark, but Tom Brady, I know you hate him, but same thing, right? Just always finding a way at the end of the game to win, you know what I'm saying? He's a clutch player, give me the ball. <coughs> and I want to show you what, what I think, I think undeniably the greatest sports play of all time. Okay, here's the setting, 1984, Liberty Bowl. Doug Cooley, Boston College against Miami, six seconds left. Throws it down. Caught by Boston College. I don't believe it. It's a touchdown. The Eagles win it. I think that's the greatest play in the history of sports. No. I think it doesn't get any better. They made a cereal out of him. Booty plays. You don't get that. That's when he was with the Buffalo Bills. Another one of those 
blanket statements, you know, like soon after, I don't know if it was a day, two, a couple hours, I'm not sure, after the last thing that went down. Uh, but soon after that, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. Okay, so I don't have a picture of uh, Israel up here, but if you would use this revolution, I know Kelly, I'll get, I'll get the board, I'll get it. Um, if you use this revolution banner as the, the shape of Israel, which is kind of similar, you know, kind of go thin, narrow, but tall. So <clears throat> up by the E is you're going to see the Sea of Galilee and a lot of the miracles that Jesus performed. You don't see it? Do you see it up there? Do you see it? Do you see it? I see it up there. I see it up there. Clearly, it's up there. It's probably the people, right? So uh, all these miracles were performed up there. And, and just like down down and to the left of the E, like almost <coughs> the bottom of the B is like there, that's Nain. Just to give you a reference point, that's where Nain is. Okay. Um, and some of you have um, maps in the back of your Bible, so you can see it. Um, where were we? Okay, so uh, they, they went, he went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. Go figure. He's always got a large crowd following him. Uh, a funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was the widow's only son, and the large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the beers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Okay, good story. You know, I love the story. It's awesome. He raised a guy from the dead. That's incredible. But we want to have a little bit more than a story. We want to grab, grab something out of it. Um, give me a little background here. This story is only found in Luke. Uh, some of the other stories that we shared are found in several of the Gospels, one, two, three, four of them. Uh, but this one is found only in the Gospel of Luke. And it's, what's kind of cool is that Luke, uh, history tells us that Luke is actually a doctor. So, like, when he says someone's dead, I, I'm just, this is just hearsay, I don't know, it's just conjecture, I'm not quite sure, I don't know Luke. But if a doctor says you're dead, it probably holds a little more credibility than if I say you're dead. I really don't know if someone's dead, I mean, I, I should, if they're not breathing, you could say they're dead, but when a doctor says you're dead, well, you're probably, what? Dead. dead. Okay. Um, what adds a little credibility to it also is that since he is a doctor, I think that him giving credit to someone else for something that he or his profession can't pull off, I think that adds credibility to his story. It's kind of, you know, everyone is trying to protect their own profession. Like, if you're, a, um, if you're a regular doctor, a medical doctor, you think chiropractors are what? Quacks. Quacks, quacks. right? You're getting quacks. Because they don't do it the same way that the medical doctor does it, right? But the, but the chiropractor, what do they call the regular doctor? A butcher, right? Because that's all they want to do is cut and medicate. So we're always trying to protect our own profession, but Luke doesn't do that here at all. He's actually giving credit to someone else for something that he and his profession cannot pull up. Okay, here's the setting here. There's a, there's a funeral. Um, fortunate to have a Jewish family, so I got to talk to my mom a little bit uh, about this story this week. Um, I grew up in a Jewish home, so I had the opportunity to, um, you know, not something to rejoice about, but I got to sit in on several funerals and, um, and all that goes along with it when I was growing up. We did a thing, um, many of you probably have never heard of this, but it's called, uh, when someone dies, usually the funeral is the next day back then because they didn't have the embalming process like now. So they would do it the next day. But uh, nowadays, they'll embalm the body, uh, they'll have the funeral, but then you'll invite friends and family over for something called sitting shiva. Okay, sitting shiva. Shiva in Hebrew actually just means seven. Okay, it's seven. And what the tradition is, is that you, for seven days, your closest would come over to your house, and you would sit there, and you would mourn. Everyone wears, I've been there, I've been there and done it, okay? it's not just someone teaching me, I've been there in the misery. I've been there when everyone comes in dressed in black. I've been there when no one talks. 
You don't watch TV. You don't listen to the radio. There's no movies. There's no jokes. You hardly talk. You sit and you lament and you mourn and it's sad. You can see a picture of this in Job. I'll give you the reference if you ever want to look it up. Job chapter 2. You'll see that. When Job is going through hell that he's going through, three buddies show up and they don't talk. They just sit there. He's got the sackcloth and ashes. They do the same thing and they just sit and they don't talk. They just kind of share the burden with them. So this is what they do. They just mourn. Now, this is crazy, but history will tell you that these Jewish folks did differently way back then. They didn't sit for seven days. Sometimes they'd sit for 30 days, and they would mourn the death of somebody. Okay? It was very, very sad. Now, here's the crazy thing. You read this story, there's this, par there's this uh, parade, if you will, right? Are you guys, like, all afraid of, that I'm going to call on you? Is that why you sit all the way back there? Yeah. <laughs> Got me yeah, what up? So there's this there's this parade coming out. You got this you gotta, you gotta know what's going on here, okay? In the Jewish religion, anything that's dead is like it's, as far as the religion goes, it's unclean. It's you don't touch it, it's it's yuck. Okay, it's just yucky. You can't go and worship God if you've got a like, dead Gooey, gooey on you. Dude, I, I don't know how else to say it other than that was ceremonially unclean, religiously unclean. So it was so bad that if you touched a dead person, you were unclean. If you touched something that touched a dead person, you were unclean. So their coffin, very unclean. Okay? They didn't bury people within the city walls. There was always a burial outside of the city wall because this is where we live. Out there is where the yucky dead stuff is. So that's why you see this funeral procession going outside of the city, and Jesus is coming in, and they're coming out, kind of that whole Jesus meets where you are thing, that's a whole other thing, but it's, it's perfect. Um, what they would do, this is crazy, is they would, not only they would be sad, and they would mourn, and wail, and cry, this is insane, they would hire professional mourners. Like, who thinks their job sucks? I mean, come on, right? A lot of people think their job sucks. Can you, like, you have a bad day, like, like if you're cutting grass and it's raining, that's kind of a bad day. You know, it's not fun to go out there, you know, or your boss gives you a hard time or something, and we all don't like our jobs at times. I mean, can you imagine these people, like, that's their job. Like, it's like the antithesis of, like, a, like when you have a, a celebration, like a birthday or a wedding, and you hire a DJ or even, like, a kid's clown or a face painter, and you're celebrating something, right? These guys get paid to be fake sad. That's sad. I mean, that, that job would suck. I mean, really, that would be the worst job ever. They pay you to sit there and, like, fake cry and fake be Like, you wouldn't even know these people, but you had to sit there and cry and holler out to the crowd so people from the village could come out and join the parade of sadness. It's a horrible situation to be in. Okay? And this is the setting that's going on as we meet Jesus here in this, in this situation. Um, for him, Jesus, a rabbi, to touch this coffin is a massive no-no. It's a massive no-no. What I want to do with you, though, tonight is I want, to sh I want to share this. This story is like a diamond. But I want to share this story from three different perspectives and see if we can glean something from it. Okay? I want to talk about the lady, the widow. I want to talk about the dead son. And I want to talk about the crowd. Okay, they're all going to speak of Jesus, but I want to talk about the, the widow, the son, and I want to speak of the crowd. Now, let's talk about this lady first, okay? Um, this lady is in a bad situation, okay? Back then, it is not the same as now. Okay, this lady is a widow. That means her husband has died and left her with a child who's now dead. Okay, if, if it's different than now, like here in 2014 in America, most ladies are getting a college education and seeking out a career. They don't need no man. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, well back then they seriously needed a man because women were treated differently back then than they are now. And so like if your husband died, all hope of provision and protection are out the window. 
Okay, and so what would happen to a woman who, who loses a husband and loses the only son that she had that could kind of step in to take over that responsibility of providing and protecting, her options are very, very limited. She's either going to become a, 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 a lady uh, of low morals, a prostitute, or she's going to be a beggar. There's just not a whole lot of options unless over time while her husband was there, they were able to just save up piles of gold. Okay, how many people are able to do that? But I mean, that's not happening. That's not happening. So she, she's kind of limited as to what she can do. So she's in a really bad situation. She's got no husband. She's got no child to step in. She's got no hope. And she's got very few options. So for her, Jesus coming in and restoring life to her son is a, is, is a massive Deliverance. Okay, and we talk about salvation being uh, going from hell to heaven quite often. That's the that's the big one. But in this situation, salvation is a little bit different. Salvation is just basically a delivery. She has been delivered from a place of hopelessness with no provision and no protection, no one to help her with a very very uh, dark future. What's up, guys? A very dark future. And Jesus comes onto the scene unexpected. She doesn't know he's coming. And he comes in overflowing. This is the big part of the story. Overflowing with compassion. I want to test you guys. See if you remember. I gave you a definition for compassion a couple months back. Does anyone remember what it is? Of course you do. Do you? You'll know what that is. Anyone else wonder about that? Yeah. Kind of weird. What if I just told you it was nothing? I just felt like doing it. Yep. Yeah. Compassion is, is really, really cool. This compassion is actually feeling someone else's pain, sharing that burden with them. Like, I feel your pain, and it's enough to make me do something to fix it. And Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus, not only did he have compassion, but he was what? overflowing with it, right? We don't see that too often in the world we live in, do we? And Jesus models this compassionate heart for us, for us all to see, where he comes in and he can actually sense and feel this woman's pain and her hopelessness, and he steps in to actually act to help her in her very, very dark situation. So she has been delivered by the grace of God. Okay, now let's just I'm going to go through these real quick. Let's talk about the sign. If, this, if, if the mother's situation is bad, the son's situation is horrible, grave. <laughs> I'm waiting for days for that. <laughs> He's flatline dead. Doctor said so, right? Um, usually they have the funeral next day. That's what's happening here. Let's talk about this kid for a second. He can't get better. Right? He can't fix himself. He can't ask for help. No amount of self-help is going to help this guy. He is what? Dead. dead. Like it's not like some of these. He, some of these things in here, we see healing. Someone's sick, and he heals them, right? This guy's not sick. He's dead. No hope. No hope, okay? He can't ask for any help. And I was reading this, and I don't know about you guys, but I realized that that's me. Dead? Dead. Seriously, dead. Absolutely. See, I don't, know, I don't know if you ever really contemplated this idea of you being dead. But the Bible talks about it a lot. And I kind of want to share this with you. I need, I need you to have a proper perspective of who you are and what your condition is. Okay? I, I, I want to tell you that I think that of all the imagery in Scripture, I think this is the greatest illustration of salvation, eternal salvation in all of that. This story right here. Okay? Maybe. The Bible tells us, and it's so very true, that the wages of our sin, the payment for your sin is what? Yeah. It's death. It's death. We learned a couple weeks ago in Psalm 15, it said that only the blameless get in. Only the blameless can stand before God and worship Him. 
But we have a death problem because every single one of us sins. So like we have a death problem just like this kid. He has a massive problem that he cannot fix. He's dead. He's not able to fix it. He can't self-help. He can't ask for help. He's dead, gone, flatlined, and that's exactly who we are. But some of us might say, and maybe not all of you in here, but some of us in our world might say that, um, you know, well, I'm just an everyday guy. Like, um, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. Um, and I, I would say right now that some of the things that I've done in my life, you know, they're pretty raunchy. I mean, I admit it. But if you think about my life, you know, before, I was just a regular everyday Joe. I mean, honestly, we can compare sins and we can have these little war stories if you really want to. But if you think about it, I mean, I, I had a job. I worked. Um, I had a car, a place to live. You know, I, I ate. I, you know, I drank. smoked. I, I didn't use very good language, but I mean, I was just in... I mean, I don't know if I was worse or better than you guys, but I was just an everyday Joe, you know? I, I, I just kind of did, actually, come to think of it, there are a lot of times in my life that I think I was actually, I hate to say this, but better than most. Like, I think some people are really, really rotten. And some people are not so rotten. I was just kind of bulk myself in with the everyday Joe guys that, you know, maybe I wasn't so good, maybe I wasn't so bad, but just everyday Joe. And I think a lot of us kind of say that, you know, like, well, I don't think that everybody's dead. I don't think that everyone's going to go to hell. Because, you know, some people are just, they're not so bad. But see, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to teach biblical Christianity, not making something up, we need to know what God thinks about us. Now, I want to share something with you, if you don't mind. Um, go to Ephesians chapter 2. It should be up on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, start in the first verse. I want to read something with you. Just so you have some clarity on what God says about every single person, not just uh, not the real, real bad ones that you might think of in your mind right now, like the hardened criminals, the, the rapists, the murderers, all those, you know, real, real bad guys. Uh, but everybody, because sometimes there's like this feeling that there's the good guys and then there's the bad guys, and we kind of classify which one we think we're in, and we try to classify what we think other people are in, and that's wrong. So let, let me share with you what it says here in, in God's Word, okay? It says here... Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, right in the first verse. Once you were dead, I'm going to find out who you are in a minute. Uh, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, some people, again, might read this and go, well, I didn't sin as bad as, and you name somebody, so you think you're okay. Um, because it says for your many sins. Well, I don't sin that much. Let's read on. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. And, you, and, you, and so now I'm reading this, right? And I'm like, well, I didn't, I don't, I don't remember ever like obeying the devil. Like, who? I mean, even when you're being nasty, you honestly start thinking like, I'm obeying the devil. Like the devil's talking to me, and I'm obeying. Does anyone ever really think about that when you were before you knew Christ? Before you knew Christ, did you actually think that, oh, the devil's my boss, and I'm following him? Like intentional Satan following. I mean, who does this? Some people are Satan worshippers. But the everyday Joe, do they, everyday Joe, I, mean, I look at you and I, okay, so, but you know what I'm saying? Like, who thinks of that? So I didn't think that that was me, uh, but let's just read on. Um, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. All of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. So, so what is he saying there? Like, I'm not, I didn't think I was following the devil. I was just kind of doing what I thought was okay. You know, like, I enjoy this and that looks fun. And I was just doing it. I don't mean any harm by it. And see, the things that you do, like, even if you did it and it wasn't a, a nasty, harmful thing, if you're following your own inclinations, you're your Lord. That's it. See, we don't think that, well, I didn't rob a bank, I didn't kill anyone, or I didn't rape anybody. Okay, but did you do, are you following your own natural instincts to do whatever your inclinations are? If you're yes, which it says all of us did, guilty. 
By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. <coughs> See, so no one's excluded from that group, are they? Everyone, everyone, everyone. But God, I love those. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Oh, come on. You remember? What happens when I say we raise Christ from the dead? Amen. Amen. He has risen? Where there is only death. 
He miraculously brings life where there wasn't anyone seeking after life. He was not seeking after life. He was not asking for life. He was not positioned to ask for life. He was dead inside of a coffin. But the most awesome thing here is that Jesus just presses through just thousands of years of Jewish tradition because it's dirty, it's a dead person, it's unclean, and he's a rabbi, but he presses through all that, and he disregards the possibility of judgmental people who are going to say, I can't believe that he just did this, and like, noose him, he doesn't care, he presses through to bring life to this most passive recipient. This guy didn't ask for it, he didn't seek out help, did he? He was totally passive. But again, as I'm reading this, I start realizing, that's me. Same thing. That's me again. Every single person on the face of the earth is born with a nature to, to rebel against God. We're all in active rebellion against God. Every single person on earth. That's just who we are. I'm not saying that you're terrible and not of value. Everyone has value made in this image to worship and be like him, but we're all by nature in rebellion against God. Every single person. Every person's default is sinful. If left to our own devices, we will sin. That's just who we are. You know, when I was in the car business, that's what I wanted. It was like, I wanted to be good, but here's what happens. In the car business, when you sell and you only make money if you sell something, it's like, okay, I've gotten to that point in the deal where I know, now this is just me, there's other car guys in the room, but this is just me. I got to the place where I realized that if I'm honest, I'm about to lose this deal and go home with nothing. Or if I just tweak the truth a little bit, mm -hmm. I make five, six hundred bucks. I'm just telling you I'm a weak dude. And I tweaked. I always tweaked. And that's what I did. And I, I couldn't live with myself. It's just my it's just our nature to be weak and give in to our own thing. And so try to save myself and provide for myself, I tweaked. That's just the way I did it. So even though our default is sinful, even though we're all in active rebellion, yet God, yet God goes to the cross, endures the cross, endures the shame. Why? For us. He showed his great love. He goes and sends his son to die while we were sinners. That's a beautiful thing that we should celebrate. We should celebrate that. Let me talk to you a little bit about the crowd, okay? The crowd of people, if you, uh, the Jordan River kind of separated uh, Jewish folks from the Gentiles. So where Nain is, uh, most of the people there are going to be Jewish, if not all. You know, that's, just, that's just the way it was. Most of them, if not all, are going to be Jewish. Now, <clears throat> these Jewish folks, they're steeped in, you know, 1,500, 16, 1,800 years worth of Hebrew traditions, okay, and belief systems. That's just their practices. They're steeped in this big time, okay? So when you look at the story here, they start talking about the crowd. What does it say here? It says, great fear swept the crowd. It swept the crowd. Now, I start thinking about this too, and I, I encourage you, when you read, don't just blaze through it. Stop and think about it. Like, why? What, why would they fear this? Like, was it something bad that happened? Like, if there's a scary movie where someone's getting axed, that, that could cause fear. But, but why were they scared? Why, where was the fear? Was it because this boy was resurrected that he started to talk? I mean, that could, that would, I mean, that would, well, let's be honest, if that happened, that would kind of freak you out, right? I think that that's probably some of it, but I, I and listen, this is not, this is not, the it's not thus saying the Lord is going to give you what I believe, okay? Now, you do what you want with the Bible, you all have one, you have access, if you don't own one, you have access to them, they're all right here, so you need to, you need to read it and, and, and come up with what you believe God's telling you, is because, because we're all going to stand before the Lord, okay? Now, th this is what I think. I think that there was great fear that swept across the crowd based on what this is saying here. It says, great fear swept across the crowd and they praised God. Now, they weren't going, holy, holy, look at this kid. I can't believe this happened. Whoa, they're not freaking out over that. Their, their response to the fear was to praise God. So what I believe, the reason why they were 
there was fear that was sweeping the crowd is because they realized, finally, after 14, 1500 years of waiting, that these people were actually standing in the presence of Almighty God. I, I think that's why they were so scared. And listen, when, when, when God, like, God is everywhere, he's this omnipresent spirit, right? But there's this manifest presence when he's like right there. And I think these people were freaking out because God was standing right in front of them. And I think that's why they were so scared. They were watching Almighty God transcend all that they knew about medicine and, and, and doctors and even religion. And he was, he was scaring them. Like, wow, this is more than anything I we've ever seen before. We heard that this was going to happen. But now, after all these years, here it is right before our eyes. Like, whoa, that would freak them out. That would freak me out. I don't know about you, but that would freak me out. I don't think they were freaking out because they were acknowledging a great miracle. Because they had seen many great miracles already. I mean, this is not a first time thing. They had seen Jesus do incredible things. So why? Why would these people? They had heard about it. I mean, it was all over Israel. That's why crowds kept coming. No matter where we went, crowds came. Because they had heard about what this Jesus has been doing. But why were they so freaked out? I think that they were freaking out because they recognized that this great promise that God had given their nation years and years before was finally actually happening before their very eyes. And I think that's why they were freaking out. So they're, they're, they're scared. They're freaking out about all this stuff. And in response to this freak out, they did what? They didn't run. They didn't hide. They didn't post OMGs on their Facebooks. What they did is they praised God. They praised God. Now, look, how did they praise God? Let's see what they said. Because I, I, mean, I want to I wanna explain why I believe what I believe, what I'm sharing with you. Okay, This is their response. They said two things. That a mighty prophet has risen among us. And then they also said God has visited his people today. Those are the two comments that are made in Scripture. So let's just kind of unpack these two things for a moment. A mighty prophet, this whole thing about these people saying a mighty prophet has risen among us, this wasn't just some arbitrary comment, okay? This is found as a promise 1,400 years earlier, okay? You know how long, like when Christmas is coming, when it's like a month away, it seems like forever when you're a kid, right? A week seems like an eternity, right? And, and now, now, look, at Christmas hasn't happened yet. Christmas is about to happen. That, that this Jesus is going to come. That's Christmas, right? So 1,400 years before the Christmas story, we see in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and I'd love for you to go there with me, please, if you, if you can. If not, let me just read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18. There's a promise that God makes. He's, he's talking to Moses. I know I'm old, but it's not me. And in, in, in 18 and 15, it says, Moses says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. So a leader, a leader, right, that you should follow and listen to. It says, like me, from among your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. Someone's coming that you ought to listen to. Uh, and, and you know what? You're going to find in the New Testament, there's a, there's a time when you hear the Father actually speak from heaven. You can hear it. And he says, that's my son. Listen to him. Okay, now let's continue on down over here in verse 17. The Lord can, now Moses says that the Lord's going to do this. But now the Lord himself reiterates, make sure it's in concrete. He says, uh, I will, in verse 18, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell the people everything I command him. Right? If you do any study of the New Testament, you're going to see Jesus says this. I say nothing of my own accord. I only tell you what my father told me to tell you. There his words not. So what is he saying? I'm him. I'm him. Uh, let's read on. He, he says here, and, and then God, this, 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 this Father in heaven that the Israelites have been praying to and worshiping for all this time, 
He says this, I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages that that prophet proclaims on my behalf. That should scare you. Yeah. <laughs> I will personally, don't make me come down there. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? That's like, you, you just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> That's what he's saying right here. I will personally, I ain't going to sit, there's going to be times I'm going to send prophets and all that stuff, but there's going to be times where I'm coming down. I'm coming down and I'll deal with you personally. If you don't listen to this messenger, I'm going to send you. Now, look, this is 1,400 years before this story in Luke. 1,400 years these Jewish people have been waiting for this moment to come. That's why they were so scared. That's why they were praising God. Because it was actually happening before their very eyes. And as a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 3, there's a, there's a moment there when Peter... He actually references this Deuteronomy 18, and he tells us that it's this Jesus that Deuteronomy is talking about. Just so you get an idea of how long you're waiting. When you're waiting for Christmas, and it seems like an eternity, they waited 511,000 days. These people have been waiting for 511,000 days. For this promise to come true. Test and patience, right? <laughs> oh, I need that. I need that. They waited for 1,400 years for this to happen. And finally, they were watching this happen. Yeah, they were scared. They were scared. Uh, let's go on here to where it says that God visited his people. Now, uh, I'm not talking about going out in nature and seeing what God has made. Or I'm not saying going out into nature and experiencing uh, the birds chirping and rainbows and all these different things. Those are good. Those are things that God does. We know from the scriptures, uh, it says in the Psalms, where can I go to escape you? Nowhere. Like, he's everywhere, right? So we know that he's here. Like, he's here, but there's a time when he actually shows up in his fullness when it's like, well, I'll deal with you personally. Like, he shows up at your front door and comes knocking, and it's God, and that's a little bit scary. There's times when that happens, okay? I want to take you on a little trip through Scripture. You can join me. I hope you have your Bibles. Okay, there's a lot of Scripture. I want you to, I want you to read this stuff. Put it before your eyes. I'm just going to take you on a journey through some Scripture verses. We'll read it together, okay? Do me a favor. Uh, go to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. And then we're going to go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 7. Again, this is just to illustrate that these comments that these Jewish people are making, they're not some arbitrary, oh, this is really cool, what's going on. They have some deep meaning to them, okay? In Isaiah chapter 7, it says this in, in verse um, 14. The Lord himself will give us a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. Does that sound familiar? To Mary? She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. So someone, someone's coming that will be born of a virgin that will actually be God with us. Like, he'll be here. It's not his, you know, his handiwork in the stars or the trees or the birds. No, he's going to be here. Like, God is going to show up and be with you. Uh, go to Isaiah 61. Speaking further about this one who will come, these are, this is what God has spoken to his people. Okay, this is about 800 years before Christmas, before the first Christmas. Isaiah 61, he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Someone's talking about this. Like, who is this? We're going to find out. Hold on. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He, he has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn, start listening here, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Skip down to verse 3. To all who mourn in Israel, Israel is just another word for his people, to all, to all who mourn, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, 
festive praise instead of despair. 800 years before the Christmas story, God promises that there's someone coming that will represent him perfectly, that is him coming down to do just that. You guys connect with that, okay? Now, do me a favor. Just so you can see, for those that, that, that for those people that say that Jesus never claimed to be God, I want you to do me a favor and go back to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is awesome. Here's young Jesus. He's a, he's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's a special guy. And he goes into the temple in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. When he came to the village, back to his village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read the scriptures. The, and how ironic. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet, which we just read, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll, found a place where it says this. The Spirit of the Lord, it's very familiar, right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant, and he sits down, all eyes in the synagogue look at him intently. Then he begins to speak to them, and this is what he says. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. I, God, stand before you. That would, that's freaking me out right now. Woo. You know what I'm saying? That's freaking me out right now. What if it was happening right here, right now? You're darn right you'd be scared. I'd be freaking out that for 1,400 years I've been waiting for this guy to show up and all of a sudden he's standing right here. That would freak me out. That's what... John, in the Gospel of John, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He created everything, He's the light, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This one who was promised all those years ago to the Jewish folks, He's standing before them now, freaking them out. And He's in, in this story in Luke 7, this guy, God Himself, is standing right before their very eyes. You're darn right, they were freaking out. They were freaking out. Now I want to do something. Many people, I've heard this is an insane, insane teaching, and I've got to say this. Somehow, some way, people think that, that there's this, this thing that Jesus did that, yeah, he was God, but he limited himself while he was here. We didn't create anything while he was there except wine. Okay, that's a great theory. Okay, that's a great theory, but I want to do I want you to do me a favor. What I'm trying to share with you tonight is that God himself shows up in front of these people, right? Not just the prophet who speaks for God, but God himself showing up right in front of these people. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm just going to read starting in verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through Him, Jesus, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Jesus Christ. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. He's the head of the church, which is His body. He is the beginning supreme over all who will rise from the dead. So He is the first in everything. Now listen up. For God in all His fullness. Say all His fullness. Awesome. For God in all His fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Now, if you'll do me just this small favor and look at chapter 2 verse 9 what does it say for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body there's no limiting himself everything that God is the creator the sustainer gravity trees stars air molecules love happiness every single thing that is in the universe that God everything that God was and is was in Jesus Christ while he dwelt among us 
his people. And that is what we see in this story. God visits his people. And so all this was simply the Jewish people acknowledging the gift of God's promised visit. I'm coming down there. And all of a sudden, after 1,400 years, here he is. Finally. He's here. He's here. And they're freaking out about it. But back to the text for a moment. After all this happens, what's the result? You go back to, to Luke for a second. What does it say? It says that the news of Jesus spread. is that the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Now, we know that the news of Jesus has spread because we're sitting here today, right? We're a long ways from Nain. But somehow, some way, this news of Jesus got over here. But what news? What, 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 what's the Bible talking about here? Like, um, Bailey is in a She's running for class president for the sophomore class of uh, Tiberius High School. And let's just face it, and she'll tell you this because we asked her and she admitted it, it's a popularity contest. I mean, it's not about the issues. Do you know what I mean? Like, what issues are there? It's a popularity contest. You know, catchy phrases and cool signs. If you're popular, you're going to get in. So it's Bailey and her friend Taylor, so it's Bay Tay. Of course they're going to win. Right? Who's not going to vote for them? Right? They got cool signs. Right? Like we have to go to school to actually get a vote. Hey, man. Uh, <laughs> me and Paul ah. decided we're going back. We're becoming presidents yeah. of school. Yeah. We got this. So, <laughs> so it, is it just a popularity contest? Like, is it is it just a popularity? Like, people are hearing about Jesus. So what I want to say is it's not about what he did that needs to spread. It's who he is that needs to spread. Um, so what news, what is he talking about here? What news about Jesus should spread? Well, I, I think it's that God himself visited us. That's the news, that, that God himself visited us. Do me a favor and go to Philippians chapter 2. I'm jumping all around the Bible tonight. I hope you guys enjoy that. I mean, I love the Bible. I love the show. But I think it's just an awesome book. I would encourage you to read it. <laughs> Here's the, um, the amazing thing about this Jesus guy, okay? It says here that, first of all, we have to have the same attitude that Christ had, it tells us. Before it even tells us kind of what his attitude is, it's telling us again, reiterating that we're supposed to become like Jesus. So for all of you that are listening right now to my voice, the, what I'm about to read to you or with you is the way you're supposed to be, okay? So look what does it say. It says, uh, though he was God... But Jesus was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He kind of emptied himself out. Uh, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. In some translations, that's what it says. It says he, he emptied himself. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God visits in all of his fullness. I talk about Jesus a lot. Who did you guess? Well, I know it sounds silly, but if you do some visiting to churches, there's a lot of talk about a lot of different things, which is cool. I talk about Jesus a lot. I talk about the gospel a lot because I think that the gospel applies to every area of life. When you're mad at someone, you need the gospel. They don't, you do. When work's not going well, you need the gospel. Your boss doesn't, you do. When your marriage is hurting, when your kids are struggling, when your job is not good, when you don't have any money, you name it, you need the gospel. See, none of us deserve anything good, yet God. Yet God. But God, in his fullness, Jesus, comes and saves you. It's just, we need to celebrate that. It's awesome. 
and, and uh, if you're coming and you go, man, I need something new, you might not get something new from me all the time, but I just want to, like uh, you said earlier, I don't have silver or gold, but give you what I got. I don't have silver or gold either, but I'll give you what I got. I give you the good news of Jesus. I give you the good news that every single one of us on earth are sinful. Every single one of us deserve the wrath of this holy God. Yet Jesus, overflowing with compassion, comes to you. And I, I know now, I know now, and, and I had a hard time with this for a long time, but I know what Paul was saying when he said, no one is righteous, not even one, and no one is seeking God. See, some of us might be thinking that we're better than others, but let's face it, none of us live up to that perfect standard of God. And so there's no us against them, it's just us. We're all yuck. Yet God, overflowing with compassion, empties himself out, endures the cross, disregarding its shame because of a future. For who? For him? Well, for you. <laughs> for you. It's awesome. I want to kind of close, close the, the, uh, the night with this. Um, again, I'm Jewish, so I got to go to these funerals. I got to go to Sit Shiva. I can actually remember one in my aunt's house. After she died, we all went to her apartment and we did that. You bring food and everyone dresses in black. It's just somber and just miserable. I mean, let's, I'm just going to tell you what gets me miserable. I mean, just, you know, like, it's awful. They mourn. They mourn. They're so sad. Uh, Non-Christians, that, that's the way people are. They mourn at the loss of somebody. Like, I don't know, it's just different for Christians. I hope you guys embrace this. Christians, biblical Christianity kind of tells us, like God tells us to set our sights on the things that are above. And that the here and now is just a blink. Because your true home is in eternity with God. So, when a Christian dies, it's not the end. See, the thing with, it, with a Christian is that the Bible tells us that there's only one way that you don't have to mourn. That even though someone dies, I can be sad that they die, but we don't really have to mourn. If that person's a Christian, you could do like Brady's husband did. He went to his own funeral, didn't he? He said, I want to go to my funeral. Let's celebrate. See, she may be sad that he's not here, but she's certainly not sad that he's not in this pain anymore, right? That's a good thing. And see, we're promised eternity with God. And it's not because we're good. Like, Jewish people try to be good to get in. Well, what the Bible actually says, not what someone taught you, but what the Bible actually says is that nothing you do good gets you in. But for the Christian who's embraced what Jesus did on the cross, you're in. And so we can celebrate. Because it's just, our time here is just but a vapor. It's like this. The best illustration I can tell you is, you know, like, you look at this rope right here. This is what it's all about. Like, and this, is, this, this, this doesn't really get it. But I did the best that I could. Do you know before you were born, God already knew you? He knew he was going to have you come to this earth. No one in this room is a mistake. And, and your parents may have told you you're a mistake, but you're not. <laughs> right? You're not. Ever. God makes life. Right? He's the one who knits the baby in the mother's womb. He puts that baby in mom. Like, he makes them. And he knew which, what day you were coming. He knew what you were going to look like. I mean, this is all just biblical Christian. I'm not, like, making something up. He knew you before you were born. Way back when. Way, 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 way back he knew. And one day, all of a sudden, you were born. But eternity, like, is forever. It just goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And this, I could just wrap this building in. But I just wanted you to cast your eyes upon it. And I don't want you to be like all the other religions that sit and worry about that. Because that's your life. Here on earth. We worry about this. And it's just a vapor. It's a blink compared to an eternity past and eternity future. 
And so we shouldn't be worried like the Jewish people are mourning for seven and thirty days at the loss. Because you know what? You know why they mourn? They really don't know. See, they think that they're going to get in. But when no one, when God, the one you believe in, never really tells you, you've got to do this many good things to get in, there's always that, I hope. If, if you've ever done any evangelism, you, you ask people, are you going to go to heaven? What do you usually get? I think so. I hope so. I'm not sure. I've done a lot of things. And so that leaves you with some fear and worry and doubt and I don't know. And, but look, the Bible's not leaving you in the dark. It, it tells you something. It tells you how to do it. It tells you to have this perspective and not to worry about it. Which is what we're in right now. John 11, 25, when he read this, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. You will live. Even after you die, you will live. So don't worry about this. Celebrate this. Look at just cast your eyes upon it. And here's your eternity. And we spend our whole lives stressing about that. I want to encourage you to do that. You have a reason to celebrate if you're a Christian. You have a reason to celebrate. You have a reason to celebrate watching Dan now. I don't know if she may not to. You have a reason to celebrate her. Decision to follow Christ, that even though she will die someday, she will live forever. Are you Christian? Are you Christian? Come on. Live us your forever. Set your eyes on that. I don't understand that communion. I don't know where it is. Can you get that? You know, we got it. We're not still here. Let's hand that out. Oh, perfect. All right.